Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Campion, and this is the Miracle of Healing on Empower Radio, where we come together every week to discuss all kinds of healing, and that's something the world needs a lot of these days, maybe now more than ever. If you're new to my show, really want to welcome you. Thanks for being here. And if you've been coming along the journey for a while, welcome back. So glad to see you back here again. Did you know that yoga can open your heart? And it can do that in so many different ways, energetically, emotionally, spiritually. And whether you're new to the practice of yoga or you're a yoga instructor, we have a beautiful guest here today and a good friend of mine, somebody that I really love uh, very much. Um, and it's, it's Ritu Kapoor, who wrote this book called Teach Yoga, Touch Hearts. Um, and, and, and Ritu is somebody that has touched my heart in so many ways that I know she's going to touch yours in this um, beautiful um, call we're going to do together where she's going to really help us learn to deepen our yoga practice with her unique, inspirational, and heart-centered approach to yoga. Um, that really includes, I feel like, the heart of yoga. So thank you so much for being here and, um, and for writing your beautiful book. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having me here. What a pleasure. Yeah. Um, and you know, tell us a little bit about your yoga journey. I know that it's um, special and has moved you in an incredible way in your life that you didn't really expect, right? Well, yeah, I I was exposed to yoga early on. I grew up in India um, and I was 22 and I moved to uh, United States um, for higher studies and work. And it wasn't until much later in life after kids that I got back into practicing yoga um, again after a really long gap. And I loved it so much right away that I wanted to learn more about it. I did a short training, which wasn't enough to start teaching. And because I never thought I would teach, I'm an occupational therapist. I was working full time, two little kids and all that. Uh, but after doing that training, I realized I needed to learn more. So I went for a full 200 hour training and I've been teaching for about 12 years. Um, but there are a lot of things happened on the way that um, allowed me to open my heart. Uh, you know, uh, we live really busy lives, especially as moms, young mothers, and um, there's usually not enough time to think about anything else other than just taking care of routines. Uh, but I, I did a couple of um, really amazing trips um, over to uh, in Tibet, um, which uh, which was quite impressionable. Um, yeah, I feel like it's you know like your spiritual journey had a few stages to it. So yoga kind of opened the door for you, and um, then created this opportunity for you to travel to Tibet. And you had like an intense spiritual awakening in Tibet, didn't you? Can you tell us a little bit about what happened there? Um, we'll go in short. <laughs> so um, I, I did this 12 day trip to Nepal and Tibet and um, to a place called Mount Kailash, which is a very spiritual religious place for Hindus and uh, Buddhist, uh, Nepali people, Tibetan people. And it is a place where we believe that Lord Shiva lives, who is the, the representation of our consciousness, the higher um, self. And um, it's hard to explain exactly what happened, but I think I came back a little bit changed. Um, um, and I had to process what happened, which I, I did some writing for a couple of years to really understand what happened. And I'm still writing. Um, and it just did something to me, um, opened me up a little bit more to, uh, to something, to the higher source or feeling that divinity all around us which i don't think i was open to before i think your journey is is really similar to to so many of us who kind of 
are logical, analytical, we kind of live on our heads, you know, and that's very much a part of, of the, the culture of the day, isn't it? It's like we, we get a job, we, we have a formula, we get married, we have kids, we work, we, you know, we get the house in the suburbs, you know, and, and, you know, and that, and that there's sort of this plan, plan our ego self has for our life. And that Mm -hmm. what, what you talk about in your book and what you've experienced is how this experience of yoga um, and the trip that the trips pilgrimages you've made um, to India and Tibet like sh- shifted you out of that and into the heart, out of your head and into your heart, you know, and that I, I've known you for a while. So it's so it's been super interesting to me to see that transition in you, you know, and you, in a way, almost don't even look like the same person you were when I when I first knew you years ago, you know. Yeah. Um, but I can see the unfoldment of your heart as you commit more and more of yourself to this. And then you write a book about the heart of yoga, you know, um, which is so beautiful. So um, that, do you think that that's a common experience that people have when they start yoga, that it helps shift them out of their minds and into their hearts a little? You know, I'm sure everybody's journey is a bit different and it it probably depends on where you start, how deep you allow yourself to go into it. Um, I have a feeling that for many people, it probably stays at the physical level for some time until something happens to shift that awareness deeper into the inner self. Um, You know, like in the book, I've talked about koshas or five layers of our being and usually we we relate to this physical layer because we can touch it and feel it we think that's who we are and it it takes something another experience to go deeper within for most people i think it would or some reading or meeting somebody special who can allow yourself to maybe discover that you know um inner self yeah, I, I've always thought because I come at this conversation from the angle of, of a Reiki teacher, a Reiki practitioner, that yoga, Reiki and meditation are the three great awakeners of our spirit, you know, in the modern world. You know, and we find yoga, Reiki and, and meditation on every street corner, pretty much, you know, mm-hmm. and and we come into those things look I don't know questing looking with curiosity or trying to solve a problem we have and all of a sudden we find ourselves in this deeper it's like a little magical door you walk through and enter a different world right yeah yeah. and you keep discovering more (laughs) yeah so it's not like you're there you're done there's more happening um all the time you know it's it's uh the spiritual world is sort of infinite, right? Yeah, definitely. So let's talk a little bit about bhakti yoga, yoga of the heart, you know, and I think that's, there are many different kinds of yoga, right? Like mm-hmm. not just styles of yoga, but um, intentions in the yogic practice, right? And mm-hmm. one of them is the bhakti, the heart opening yoga. Mm-hmm. So let's maybe you can help us understand how does yoga open the heart and 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 what 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 does that even mean really so yes in in bhagavad gita which is one of the spiritual texts that comes from india uh, many types of yoga has been defined one that people may uh, have heard is karma yoga you know mm-hmm. you you're acting and most of us can relate to that a little bit more because we are doers we are constantly doing this doing that uh, perhaps not the way Gita tells us that do it without any attachments, but we are doers. Um, and that comes a little bit more easy to us. Bhakti yoga, which actually um, talks about surrendering to this higher power, is I feel a lot hotter. Mm-hmm. I couldn't really relate to bhakti yoga for many, many years, even after becoming a yoga teacher. I think my trip to Tibet moved me from karma yoga to at least understanding what bhakti yoga is. Uh, Surrender is an interesting word. You know, I think in English context, um, 
sometimes it, it can have a negative connotation, like surrendering to the enemy type of thing. But in bhakti yoga, that's not the surrender, kind of surrender. Um, it's about trusting the process. It's about trusting that there's higher power behind everything that's happening. And mm. to allow yourself to trust the process and flow with it, which again, doesn't come easy, right? Uh, we, we want to control everything. We think yeah. we do. Yeah. I mean, I had an experience of that in a yoga class, actually, many years ago, of uh, the in the yoga sequence was a lot of heart opening positions, you know, so we were in a heart open, se chest opening sequence. And I was like, um, grateful that I had such a cool yoga teacher, because at some part in the heart opening sequence, I started to cry. And mm. I was really like, self-conscious because i'm like are you supposed to cry is it okay if you cry in yoga <laughs> like is somebody gonna be and she was like oh that's wonderful you know everyone should cry like right. you know and, and and then at the end of this we were um you know in a, in a resting pose um at the end of class and i i had this experience of like my the back of my heart chakra opening in a different way and the feeling of falling backwards into i don't know divine and it was hard it was a sort of liminal experience and hard to describe really what it was but my teacher just winked at me and said welcome to bhakti yoga <laughs> like this is that that feeling of falling backwards into and not like a trust fall really yeah yeah you know that yeah, was my neither. that was my first experience with it and i was like oh it's so much more than you know just flowing like just doing the asana with like correctly right that's right that's right no it sounded beautiful the way you described it because you are in touch with the chakras so somebody who didn't know what chakras were they wouldn't be able to describe it that way mm -hmm. they may feel something but uh, may not be able to explain what happened and in fact it's it's very hard to explain these things because words limit you um you know, just like I was talking about the word surrender. So words are limiting. Um, your experience is bigger than putting it into words. Right. Um, yeah. And so what, what, for people who are new to yoga, what are some um, things they can do to maybe connect with the heart, this open heart idea? I feel for me, reading um, books that inspire, um, touch my heart um i think right away um reading sometimes again and again brings you a deeper understanding of the same text uh recently um or more than recently uh this last year i started reading john o'donohue and his books mm -hmm. and they are he writes beautifully um the text is it opens you up, it inspires you, it's heartwarming. Um, people can even, you know, get his audiobooks and the way he talks in his really beautiful Irish accent. I feel that I feel that is very heart opening. So, you know, reading or connecting with teachers that uh, inspire you is one way. Creating a personal practice will, of course, help you to open your heart as well. Um, and practice could be anything. It could be yoga asanas, it could be meditation, um, Reiki, um, any practice that allows you to find that stillness within, to connect with that inner self. It could be being out in nature, taking a walk in nature, or just sitting by a lake. So mm -hmm. different things um, will work for different people. I find that um, our spiritual, like you can kind of get to a certain forward progress in your spiritual journey, and then it, you have to adapt, adopt a spiritual practice. And if you don't, you're kind of dead in the water, like you can't progress any farther than that. And people, I tell this to my students all the time, and people are like, well, what's a spiritual practice, you know, and it can be meditation, it can be yoga, it can be um 
you know, all, walking in the woods, like you said, all kinds of different ways that we do spiritual practice, but yoga is a particularly powerful um, one. And there's some, in my mind, I recommend it to a lot of people. And there's something about showing up on the mat every day or, or that was sort of the discipline part of spiritual practice that I think is super important to move us forward. What, what, what do you think about that? You know, from the day I started doing yoga, uh, I have been on my mat every single day. I do not miss, I haven't missed a day for the last 12 years. No matter when we go on vacations, my mat goes with me. It's it's just something that comes from within. Um, for some people, it may have to be more like a discipline initially. You know, I, I have to get on my mat sort of thing. And you make yourself do it and slowly it becomes a habit. But yes, being on the mat, um, even if you're starting with just a physical asana-based practice, will shift something within over time. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing happens overnight. So it will take time to, um, to feel that inner presence, if you may. And what, what do you think the benefit of sort of pushing through those times when you don't want to do it and you're like oh, eh. that's you know today when we push through and we really dedicate ourselves to that discipline what what happens what's on the other side you know uh, i'll have to say from personal experience i've never had to push myself it just came to me uh, i never said i must do it it just i felt like i i had to do it because there was sort of a almost like a calling. So I don't know about pushing yourself. Um, it may backfire for some people, but for others, that's that may be what they need. Mm. But the practice can change on daily basis too. You don't have to do so many rounds of sun salutations or warrior poses every day. One day, maybe you want to stay in child's pose for a while. Another day, you may want to have a longer shavasana or practice yoga nidra. So the practice can change based on not just the seasons or the weather, but also your moods and your energy where you're at. Um, that's, that's good. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's beautiful. And so your, your book um, is really... It's called Teach Yoga, Touch Hearts. It's real. Is it really geared towards yoga instructors to help them um, expand their practice? You know, in in the book, I am talking to yoga instructors, so it is addressed to them. Um, when I was writing the book, I I kind of thought about who should be my audience, and if if the audience was general, I would have to um, change the language a little bit more. Although I've still kept the language very simple, uh, but I, I have geared it toward yoga teachers, although I feel anybody who loves yoga will find it beneficial and will find it easy enough to read and understand. Yeah. Uh, but I thought gearing it towards yoga teachers because they are the ones who who can reach out to more people so they can inspire others with use of these quotes and passages that I've shared in the book. Um, right. Well, that's what's so beautiful about your book is that one of the things that it seems very unique to me is that all of the poetry and, inspira and quotes and inspirational things that you put in there. It's a, a heart opening experience just reading the book. Um, what, why did you include all that, all those inspirational things? I mean, I, I have my theory about why you did, but, but tell me why for you, what happened? You know, I, I included what worked for me. Um, so although yoga comes from India and many books talk about what yoga scriptures, um, like Yoga Sutras, Bhagavad Gita talk about, but I wanted to include other ways of how uh, people from other cultures have expressed their spirituality. And because that inspires me, um, 
I have brought this sort of universal spirituality in this book. You know, I've included poems by Mary Oliver and John O'Donohue and Rumi, who was from Persia a few thousand years ago. Uh, and if you really listen to all of them, I think they're all saying the same thing. And by doing that, you can see how we're all spiritual beings. Spirituality is a universal thing. Uh, and that was one of the things. But again, another thing is because I find everything that I've written here, I have used in my classes and I find it very inspiring. Mm. Yeah, that's great. And what, what, what do we do during the pandemic? So I was reading your book and I was like, uh, you know, there's sort of a section where there there's like class ideas for instructors. And I'm yeah. not a yoga instructor, but I was like, I bet I could, I know enough about yoga. I was like, I bet I could get on the mat and go through this flow that she talked about um, because it's a little hard to get into a yoga studio at the moment, you know, with the pandemic that we're in. So what? how, how has the pandemic changed the way you practice yoga and the, and has it made it more available in a way to the rest of us? I think so, because, you know, whereas before an hour yoga class would mean you have to take two hours out of your day because you needed time to get somewhere and then be back. Mm -hmm. And it was same for me. One hour class meant at least two hours because I had to show up before. And then at the end of the class, it takes time to clean the studio and be back. So now one hour class is exactly one hour for me. Um, and students who do show up in my Zoom classes, they love it too. They don't have to leave their house. We don't have to cancel classes because of snow or any other reason. And um, it definitely made more time, personal time available to me. Hmm. And I, I think bringing my book out is... Um, is a huge a huge reason is that we we were in a lockdown because i think i was running in circles like most of us before right. the pandemic um, so this extra time was amazing to go inwards and if we wanted to take a class with you reach you online how would we do it my um find me on my website email me and i'll send you a zoom link for a complimentary class first class is complimentary so you can see my style and if that works for you um we can talk more oh wonderful <laughs> and there it is it's sohum.org um yeah. and it and um it's so it's so funny because i used to have a brick and mortar um place called Soham, which I've taught in many times. I've spent a lot of time in your studio you have, um, te yeah. teaching Reiki <laughs> and doing other things. So um, so I think it's so fantastic that you're bringing that energy to the world that we can all experience it this way. And if we wanted to get your book, how where is your book available? So it was published on lulu.com. It is available there, but most people go on Amazon. Um, you mm -hmm. can see the link up there. And on Amazon, they've done a beautiful job where you can peek inside. It says, look inside on top, and you can read the forward note by Swami Mahesh, a beautiful note that he wrote. Um, and you can read the first chapter of the book and the contents. So. Wonderful. Good. Well, I, I thank you so much for um, for being here today and for writing this book. And I, I just keep thinking like the this pandemic, so many of us slowed down and so many of us reevaluated our lives and so many of us had to stop kind of that forward crazy motion that we were. It's like this, you know, hamster wheel that we were right. on um, and that that this is another beautiful opportunity to go inward and really find who we are. So thank you so much for for the work that you're doing. And I'm going to, I'm going to take one of your yoga classes. Awesome. I would love can't wait to, to do it. in a class, Lisa. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to do it. I can't wait to do it. What a pleasure to talk to you here. Thank you so much, honey, and for all of your beautiful work. And thank all of you guys for showing up today and being with us um, where we are healing the planet one person at a time right here on Empower Radio.